Hi, Kanishiwa. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I am a union woman, just as strong as I can be. I do not like the bosses, and the bosses don't like me. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Tell me which side are you on? Which side are you on? I bring you greetings on behalf of National Clue. I see Hedy Schofield is here, our interim executive director. Last night, Afnan was on, Afnan Adams, our communications specialist, and of course, our, the National Officers Council who are here and were here last night. This is wonderful. I bring you the power of SNAP. Sisters, siblings, not afraid of power. I give thanks to our sister state president, Adriana, snap, and to our sister state vice president, Nicole, snap, and to the California Planning Committee, because you know it takes a village of snaps to raise a conference and of this magnitude. So snap times 34 for all the sister siblings that were here last night who stayed up, Lord have mercy, I don't know, it was, it was 10 o'clock or 10, 15 or something when I signed off, and y'all were like, and now we're going into the breakout room. And I was like, oh, but no, not the kid. <laughs> but I'm back today, and I'm so glad, because I know that last night, in the words of Maya Angelou, and still we rise. We rise, we reimagine, we inspire, we succeed, we elevate it. Oh, snap, the stories we heard last night. Oh, <laughs> Goodness, my goodness. Okay, now I'm about to get off topic again, but let me get back on topic. First of all, let me thank you for that beautiful video. And I'm reminded, sisters, that this is how we're going to do the parade of uh, chapters and the unions at our convention in September. Because we're going to be online, because we're going to be on Zoom, y'all going to have to make your own videos or PowerPoints with your pictures. And so that's how we'll march in, but we'll use it using technology. And thanks for the tech, the Zoom techs who are behind this meeting today and thanks for the magic of zoom really i said this last night adriana came to us two years ago in 2019 and said oh you know there's this new thing called zoom and you all should try it we're like oh yeah sure yeah Andrew. i'll i'll do it for the noc so she did it for us i'm like oh mm -hmm. interesting i still got it on my phone because i didn't even know how to put it on my computer at the time so it's only on my phone and then she said i'm gonna sit out here in the lobby and i'm gonna do zoom uh, classes for anybody who wants to come up and learn Zoom. We're like, oh yeah, sure. Go for it, sis. How do we know that a pandemic was going to hit in 2020 and this would become the tool of democracy for us to reach out, for me to be here on a Saturday morning with y'all on the West Coast. Hallelujah. Thank you to all the East Coast sisters and the Central sisters and everybody else who's on here. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I didn't, I want to tell a little bit about my story before I, I go on, but um, and I, I was reminded of this by the women in non-traditional trades conference that I was at, that when I was in high school, I played field hockey and I played uh, basketball. And in the basketball team, we were only allowed to play half court. Right. Anybody else with me on this one? Raise your hand. The half court playing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And when I went to the, our, the coach, uh, our teacher and said, uh, Ms. Briggs, why are we only playing half court? And she said, I don't know. And nobody ever answered the question. And I believe to this day, that's because they thought that if we played full court, our uteruses would drop out and we would somehow be disconnected from our ovaries or some kind of wacko thing like that, because otherwise it makes no sense. It wasn't like we were incapable of running full court, but it really ultimately, I believe that it was because the powers that be fear the power of women. I believe the, the power elite of men who run this country, who run the world for that matter, really are afraid of a full court press by women. And that's why they want to limit what we do. Even to this day, there are men in powerful places who are still afraid of our power. I ran for President Clue because Hillary Clinton lost when she ran for president. I was like, wait a minute, Elise, you've been talking to sisters for years about run for office, not for coffee, run for office, not for coffee. And I had never run for a contested position. I held a position on the board of my union, CWA, the Newspaper Guild Local 32035, but it was an at-large member. Nobody ever ran against me. I mean, I ran by acclamation. So I said, okay, 
put your money where your mouth is. And I ran for vice president of my local and lost. And then I ran for president of Clue. This is in 2017. Okay, September, I ran for president of Clue and I won. And then I went back and we ran again because the Department of Labor overturned our election in our local and said, uh uh, our opponents had, you know, tried some funny stuff. Anyway, we ran the election again. I won. And I became vice president of my local. And I said, because I have to do this. I can't tell other women what to do and not be willing to do it myself. And when, when my next generation sisters in, in my local came up to me last year and said, Elise, we, we're thinking about running for president and vice president. What do you think about that? And I went, Mah. it's working. My trick is working. They're going to run. I said, honey, please run. I'm back you all the way, all the time so that we can do this and we can do this together and only together. And we we did this so well that November, we kicked serious butt. Sisters, you know that in California, in Nevada, in Georgia, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Wisconsin. I mean, we just did it over and over. And they know that. They know that. 2021 is going to be different. And I know that on, thir on Friday morning, this past Friday morning, Liz Schuler, Randy Weingarten from American Federation Teachers, uh, Cindy Estrada, my sister from the UAW, I Jin Poo from the Domestic Workers Alliance, and there was two or three other sisters who met with Kamala Harris on Friday morning to talk about women's working women's agenda and union women's agenda. And all I'm asking for is I want to be at the next meeting, okay? I'm like, you know, I'm glad it went well, but I think Clue ought to be there because we are still the only national organization of union women in the country. So yeah, we ought to be at the table, which brings me. Um, real quick to the pandemic. And I was recently interviewed by a reporter who asked me about racism, especially after the murders in Atlanta this past week. Racism against our Asian American Pacific Islander siblings did not start last week or last year. It started even before World War II. But World War II is when our government put Japanese American citizens 62% of the people in those concentration camps were citizens of the United States, born and raised in the United States. They weren't foreigners, but even the people who were immigrants did not deserve to be put in concentration camps. I don't call them internment camps. They were concentration camps like the Nazis had, and that's why we ought to call it what it is. And even then, we look at our history since World War II, all the wars, all the major wars, undeclared wars have been against who? Asian countries and Middle Eastern countries, people of color. You name it, since the Vietnam War. That's no accident. That's on purpose. Um, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Connect with computer audio. And that's how. Oh, hello. Is that time? No. OK, let me. I'm not going to rush. All right, let me just go back to 1952, the year after I was born. Federal policy barred immigrants of Asian descent from voting and becoming citizens and having access to the vote. That was 1952. And today, Asian Americans are quickly becoming one of the largest electoral votes in our country. And so we have to be vigilant because that's what the whole thing against the immigration people from um, Central and Latin America. They don't want to make people citizens because they know what they're going to do. They're going to vote against the Republicans. They're going to vote against the 1%. So when anybody's excluded, as we say in the labor movement, an injury to one, it's an injury to all. And when someone is denied the right to vote, it's to everybody, which reminds me, OK, all right. Sojourner Truth, you know, 170 years ago said, ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arms. I planted and plowed and gathered in barns. First woman to God made all that stuff. 170 years ago, they still haven't passed the ERA. We need to be writing to the senators now, talking about how we you know, they, they, they took away the deadline. They were trying to say it would expire. Justice denied, de justice de delayed. It's just as at night. We need that ERA, Equal Rights Amendment, to pass right now in our lifetime, not waiting for our children. I was on a panel on, um, on Thursday night with the uh, University of California, Los Angeles Labor Studies Program with my dear sister, Yunira Moreno from uh, LACLA, who I just, she was with us when we, when we had our vigil for the 100th anniversary of Women's Right to Vote. Yunira was there with us. And I, I learned this from my sister president, Monica uh, Tamareth, who's the president of Apollo. And she said that three in 10 Asian Americans, a number higher than those of other groups surveyed, reported that they had been subjected to slurs or jokes because of their race or ethnicity 
since the start of the coronavirus outbreak. And we know what happened this past week when those women were murdered in Atlanta. That is not, I mean, that's racism and sexism. And while that investigation is going on, the death of those six women underscored to us in clue how racism and sexism work together, they're linked. Remember, we know this, race is a political construct. It's not a biological reality, because if it were a biological reality, we wouldn't be able to have sex and make these children who come out looking like cafe au lait, caramel, and everything in between, because there's only one race. It's the human race. And they use it to divide us because they want to keep the working class from joining together because there's more of us than there are of them. And you got to believe that they know that. Asian Americans, Native Americans, Latin, Latinx Americans, African Americans, and European Americans, working class, when we vote, we win. And that's the basic fact. And that's why the Republicans have passed over 200 bills in the states across this country to, to suppress the vote. They don't wonder what happened in 2020, happened again in 2022 or 2024. But you know, we woke, we woke y'all, and we're not going back to sleep. Sexism is the prejudice of stereotyping and discrimination against women based on gender or perceived gender. For our Asian American Pacific Islander sisters, it's the male order bride stereotype, the China Dow stereotype, the geisha stereotype, the belief that Asian Pacific American sisters are here to cater to the sexual needs of men, period, have no other purpose other than that. This myth is perpetrated by those who fear the power of women. That's what it's all about. It's not about sex. They try to claim this guy was some kind of sexaholic and that's why he murdered those people in Atlanta. That is just nonsense. It's another lie being perpetrated by the system to make it seem like he's human. He just made a mistake. Bullshit. Oh, I'm sorry. I said it, didn't I? Mm -hmm. BS. He did it because of those, who those women are and what they represent, that stereotype. And this myth is perpetrated by those who fear the power of women, all women. They fear queer women. They fear transgendered women. Any woman who dares to say, hey, keep your hands off of me, they're scared. So the stereotypes are fixed images based on sometimes real traits, but it's fixed. It's that part that makes it like seem like we're all that way. So for Latinx sisters, it's the cleavage, bulging, fast-talking, hair-tossing, Mexican spitfire stereotype that started with Hollywood stars like Carmen Miranda, who I adored, but who wasn't even Mexican. She was Portuguese, okay? And to continues this day with talented sisters like Sofia Vergara, who take parts that they are given because if they don't do that, they don't work. That's why Penelope Cruz is trying to do her own films and starting other sisters of Latinx descent are making their own films. And for women of African-American descent, where do I start? Okay, let's start with Mammy in Gone with the Wind, okay? And then we'll go to, now are the days, um, our sister uh, in, the, in the series Empire, played by Taraji P. Henson, even her name is an insult, Cookie Lion, okay? Cookie, sweet and crunchy, lying, she easy to get, just lying on it, okay? No, she deserves better than that. Taraji P. Henson can actually act. And then there's Halle Berry, the first woman of color, the first woman of color to get Best Actress Award from the Academy Awards. And what does she get it for? For a movie where she bared her behind and begged a white man for sex. Who comes up with this stuff? I mean, really, and I, you know, where did I get this information? Go online and Google sexiest women in Hollywood. All right. There's a list of them. For for our for our um Asian American sisters, I mean not Asian American, I'm gonna go back. For our Native American First Nation sisters, it's the it's the stereotype of Pocahontas, right? Pocahontas, demure, easy, yeah, you know, get married to white man. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Y'all, that's a that's a myth, first of all. Pocahontas, unlike Meghan Markle, when she went to England, was treated like royalty. It was her husband that was treated like dirt, the white man she married. Why? Because he was a commoner. Before there was race, there was class. They saw Pocahontas for the princess royalty that she was. So she didn't get the crap that Meghan Markle got. She was like, oh, welcome, princess. Now your husband, he got to stand aside because he's just a commoner. They didn't care about what color he was because race was invented in the United States, y'all. That's based on color. 
And for um, <laughs> for our uh, for our um, European American sisters, commonly called white. Oh my God! I mean, let's start with Mae West in the '30s, Marilyn Monroe in the '50s, Angelina Jolie, Angelina Jolie in the '80s, and Emma Stone now. And I got these names from off the internet. Just type in sexiest women in Hollywood, okay? They got lists of them, 50 of them, 20 of them, you name it. The common denominator is this, tits, ass, and easy access. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It's about power. And as long as they can reduce us to the size of our busts, the width of our buttocks, and the toss of our hair, we are just objects of heterosexist male fantasies. And it's gotta stop. We have to make our own films. There's a great documentary out. I'm going to just do a little plug here called A Woman's Work about professional football cheerleaders. It's, it's, it's directed and written by a sister of uh, Asian American Pacific Islander uh, heritage. And it's about these cheerleaders. Y'all know this? Have y'all seen it? Anybody seen it? Right. It's about the professional football league's cheerleaders. Some of them get paid less than $5 an hour. Many of them make less than the freaking mascots. And these women are athletes, they're dancers, they're trained to do it. And it's just nonsense, but I digress. Okay, okay, let me back up, here we go. Okay, so today we are here together to rise, to reimagine, to inspire, to succeed, and to elevate. So I'm gonna say this, in our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies magnified a thousand fold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Now, people sometimes ask, why do I sing all the time? It's all because you can sing. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. If you couldn't sing like Aretha Franklin, you couldn't sing. They told me straight up, she can't sing. So I didn't sing for years, for years, literally. I would sing in choir, but I would never sing solo. But then someone told me that when you sing, you organize twice. And then I learned that music is the only thing that happens in both hemispheres of our brain. So when that video is showing, we can see things, but that music is having a whole different impact on us. I sing, and I tell people this, not because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. And when I went to South Africa, my siblings in the trade union movement that sang everywhere we went. They sang on every coffee break. They sang in four part harmony. I asked them, how do you know what part to sing? They said, what you talking about, what part you sing? I said, you know, soprano, alto, tenor, they, ah, 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 ah. you just sing. We sing. We sing in praise of the First Nations indigenous people on whose stolen land we sit. We stand and pray for America, our country in these turbulent days. We pray for those who choose violence, whatever their color. We pray for the healing of those who profess to be patriots, yet would storm our capital in the name of white supremacy and patriarchy. We pray for our places of worship who will not be complicit in this injustice by being silent, but rise up, rise, and speak truth to power and advance the values of our respective faith. In the name of the ancestors whose land was stolen, in the name of the children on whose show, who are being held in cages, in the name of those who continue to this day to labor without pay, in the name of the essential workers who work today and every day during this pandemic. In the name of the founding mothers of the Coalition of Labor Union Women, I leave you with these words. They divide us by our color. They divide us by our tongue. They divide us men and women. They divide us old and young. But they'll tremble at our voices when they hear these verses sung. The union brought my family up and out of poverty, as so many of us. The union made it possible to join together with my sisters of all colors. The union made it possible to bring us together, LGBTQ and everybody else, immigrant, native born, to build a better union, to make, in the words of the constitution, a more perfect union. So today we gather together and solidarity forever, California solidarity forever yeah you can sing with me even though you're on mute solidarity forever song brings us together song empowers when we sing together we breathe together 
When we breathe together, our hearts synchronize as one. For the union makes us strong. Thank you. Thank you, Clue family. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Elise. Thank you, Elise. Fabulous. Wonderful. Inspiring. Definitely rise, risen to the occasion. Wonderful leader. Fabulous woman. We have Hetty Schofield with us this morning, sisters. Let me introduce her. Yay! Hetty's the interim director for uh, the National Coalition of Labor Union Women. Those that are new to the program, uh, we're starting now moving into uh, the leadership for the National, introducing them. Thank you for being with us this morning, Hetty. Please uh, uh, address the delegation and let us know what fabulous things are going on in DC. You have to unmute, my dear. I'm going to ask you to unmute so we can hear your lovely voice. Okay, I, thought, I thought I was unmuted. Okay, can you hear me okay? It's All fine. right, thank you. Uh, my name is Hetty Schofield. I uh, live in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and, and I am a retiree from communications workers, CWA. Um, out of, I worked in Washington for a while and then moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and then retired. So I have been doing this for about a year. And um, just as the interim director, and we'll continue to do it until uh, I think the pandemic's over and things settle down a little bit. So I wanted to talk to you today because uh, I want to talk to you about what have we been doing in the last year. And Elise hit on something, two things that I think are really important. One is your theme. Your theme is rise. We don't rise alone. And I think that's important. We know none of us rise alone. We have to have people surround us who support us um, and help us in that effort. And the other thing is Elise mentioned being at the table. So I'm thinking we have two tables at the national, right? We have the kitchen table. And at the kitchen table is where I am in my house coat every morning with a cup of coffee and a, a bowl of cereal, probably with milk dripping down my chin. And that's the most comfortable. And that, that piece, that piece is where uh, around the table with me are the constituency group. We are part of the constituency group of the AFL-CIO. And for those of you who don't understand that, it's, these are the umbrella groups that fall under the AFL. So for we have LACLA, the Latin American Council, uh, Council for Advancement. We have APALA, the Asian Pacific um, American Labor Alliance. We have CBTU, Coalition of Black, Black Trade Unionists. And we have APRI, which is an A. Philip Randolph. And we have Pride at Work, which is LGBTQ. So we sit around the kitchen table together and we work together constantly. We meet once every other week um, in, on an afternoon, about two hours. And that forms the basis for what we do, not only with the AFL, but what we do with each other. So that's a huge piece. And then we have the dining room table. For those of you that have one, now it, it's a dining room table. That's a little bit more formal, right? That's where you invite the company or the company invites you to their dining room table. Well, we have lots of organizations that we work with, some off and on, and some constantly, and they're all long-term organizations. So let me go, I wanna just go through a few of those. One is the National Women's Law Center. The National Women's Law Center puts out a letter every year to the Congress, and the Congress expects this letter, talking about women's issues globally. And they also work on education, which is Title IX. Title IX uh, is what is the basis or no discrimination in education. They work on sexual harassment. They work on uh, getting women judges. And then we have the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights that we're a part of. And that's a coalition of about 200 organizations to support and encourage and push forward women's rights, disability rights, LGBTQ, well, LGBTQ rights, and immigrant rights. There was an, also an organization called Our Court. Who knew, right? Who knew there was an organization called Our, Our Court, who is a who is a really long-term organization that really gets down with precision and watches who gets placed in the court system, where and why. And why is this important? Because the court system, as you know, is um, is everything. And they train and encourage uh, women 
as well as minorities to get involved in and run for judges. Then we have a, a group called We Demand More. Makes sense, right? We Demand More. The coalition that we recently worked on was Paid Leave for All. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then Immigrant Justice, which is sorely needed. We can't have enough of that right now. There's the National Partnership for Women and Families. That's a nonpartisan group that works to improve the lives of women and families with economic justice and also reproductive rights, which is huge. National Domestic Workers Alliance. Policy changes with regard to in care, in, excuse me, care workers, house cleaners, nannies. I'm sure that you know that because I just was speaking in California that we won the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which is in nine states in Seattle right now. That's in effect. Moms Rising, have you heard of that group? They fight for policies that help women with pregnancy protection, child care, health care, early childhood education. Voto Latino immigrant justice, gun violence protection, assisting Latinx people with registering and voting, and the New American Leaders. The New American Leaders is an interesting group. It encourages first and second generation Americans to run for office, and they train and educate people in that area. So those are just a few I, I thought were the more interesting ones. Oh, and there's always um, the Women's March. You're familiar with the Women's March every year. This year, Afnan, who you met last night, was on the planning committee for the Women's March for us. And absolutely, they, she was instrumental in getting a Women's March for the first time in Oklahoma. So I thought that was, that was a, a really a great asset. All this stuff, most of this stuff, town halls, actions, were all done virtually this year. But that won't be forever. I mean, we're, we'll be back in action in every one of our communities soon with Women's Marches and and um, fighting for immigrant justice, I'm sure. So as an organization, we spread ourselves wide because in order to get support, you need to give support. And that is, is really important to us in the labor and social justice fields of all the organizations that we're a part of. Our membership is diverse. And so we belong and support organizations and coalitions that represent that diversity. So what I'd like to say really quickly in closing is, I want you, we talk about joining a table, whether it's the dining room table or the kitchen table, find a table in your community. Find a table where you can sit around, you can sit around that table and not only give your opinions, but learn and educate and get opinions given to you. So you can see both sides of the matter. You can support what you think is the, what you feel is the right support to give, whether that's, you know, it could be an education piece, it can be an action piece, it can be a childcare piece, it can be whatever you need, what you can do to, uh, at that table to join and, and be a part, just be a part of your community more. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, Sister Hetty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We appreciate all you do, uh, and 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 very supportive of the chapters, California and other states in general. Thank you for being there. Uh, I'd like to move into this portion of the program to highlight the. We talked about the leadership. Uh, Nicole, you have a video in terms of the leadership. Let's go ahead and play that. There may not be any sound, sisters. But that's because we want to uh, be able to. to highlight every individual as they, as they uh, come up so that they can speak at the same time rather than drown them out. Uh, we're gonna go into introductions for chapter president. And we have four chapters within the state of California. We have one in Los Angeles. We have another in San Francisco, San Diego and Sacramento. Now you're seeing our national leadership. Not all are able to be here today. So in homage to them, we are highlighting who those individuals are. So we're gonna, while that's playing, I wanna uh, introduce Danae, you can see her slide here. And she is the Los Angeles chapter president. Thank you, sister Danae, doing wonderful dynamic things in Los Angeles, uh, being, uh, taking up the mantle of leadership when our friend and sister Close to my heart, Juanita Cook passed away. Uh, big shoes to fill, 
but I have faith in the ability of uh, Danae Pol. I want to get upset, but you know she's she's here with us now, Juanita, uh, and she's in spirit. Uh, Danae, please uh, address your delegation. Thank you, sister. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Danae Poliant. Um, I am, as uh, Adriana de la Cruz had uh, already spoke, um, I am the CLU Los Angeles chapter president. Um, I am also a journeyman uh, transportation wireman with the International Brother of Electrical Workers, um, and, uh, Local 11. I'm just here for all of us to help, to help out help us all rise and see our own potential. And I can't, I can't even begin to say how lucky I am to be here with all of you powerful women. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Um, sister Tamika Cook couldn't be here this morning. I know that she would like to have been here. Uh, in her stead, I'd like to go to impromptu to Becky Hunt. Uh, and then we're going to go now to Ruth Ibarra, if she's here in the room. She speaks later. Uh, has been feeling well of late, but I appreciate all she does. And then we have Victoria Sawicki, who is here, which we're going to uh, go to right now. Victoria, thank you, honey, for being here. Oh, really you. appreciate you. Thank you so much for this uh for this um, space for women to come together, um, a virtual table, so be it. And um, it's amazing what you've created, the slideshows, the photos, the people, the attendees. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Victoria Sawicki. I've been a letter carrier belonging to the Letter Carriers Union for 46 years. I delivered mail in San Francisco. Yes, up, up and down those hills for 35 years. Uh, recently, I'm kind of very proud of the fact that I've been appointed the chairperson of the Human Rights and Human Relations Committee um, Commission in Richmond. It's a big, big honor. Um, I wanna um, just do a shout out for all the essential workers that are working right now today. Um, the nurses, the grocery clerks, the letter carriers, the postal clerks, all of us that are doing work that we have been doing before the pandemic, but what's different now is people are discovering that we're essential. We, our work matters and we matter big time. And we're not gonna let them forget it, right? We're gonna take on, we're gonna own our essentialness. We're gonna completely own it and we're gonna go forward and we're gonna make sure that we have paid maternity leave, equal pay for women, um, you know, a secure retirement. All these things have to become a reality sooner rather than later. And we're gonna do it because we're gonna own our essential fact that we're essential and we all matter big time. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, thank you. Dynamo in Northern California. I see that our tr national treasurer is here. May I say hello and a big, wonderful hug, virtual hug to Judy, Judy Beard, ladies. Sisters. Hello, sisters. Good to see you. Good to see you. So where are you right now? Doing wonderful things for what, what, what Victoria just uh, talked about for the National Letter Carriers, I believe. Uh, yes, I know her uh, well, and uh, I thank her for the work that she has done, as well as all of you. For all of you are lobbyists. Those things that you believe in with your heart and soul, you contact your members of Congress and you um, ask them to support them. And sometimes you contact members of Congress or elected officials at the state level or your city council and you just express your opinion and you let them know what you like and what you don't like because we are valuable, we are powerful, we vote. And because we vote, we do something 
even more important, we influence others. So a lobbyist is a person that influences people to think like they do, influence people to believe in what they believe in. And sometimes we have to share our stories in order for people to get their attention on the issue. If a person uh, didn't have food and didn't have a place to live because of the pandemic, and they wanted to make sure that this bill that was just passed into law was gonna include the $1,400 that they needed. They would pick up the phone and they call their member of Congress who votes and explain, hey, I'm out on the street. I'm living in my car and I don't even have money for gas. Please pass this legislation. So all of us are lobbyists, but what we have to do, we have to learn to lobby on both sides of the aisle. We have to learn to talk to Republicans, Democrats, socialists, independents. We have to learn to talk to everybody because we can influence them to think like we're thinking. So I work for the American Postal Workers Union. I'm their national legislative and political director. I was elected to the position, thank you, I was elected to the position four years ago. I ran in two elections. I'm the only female national union legislative director. The only union in, in this big old, you know, AFL-CIO, I represent everybody across the country. I am your CLUE treasurer because I've been involved with CLUE I, I kind of joke about it since the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, I was a, very young in the beginning and I didn't understand the value of getting into a room. So when I went to the first uh, clue convention, I didn't get in the room. It was overcrowded. They didn't expect as many women coming from all over the country as they did. And everybody didn't get in the room where they were voting and making decisions. And so I went back home and I thought about it. I was a local union. I was the sergeant of arms for my local, the sergeant of arms. And you said, well, why would she be the sergeant of arms? Well, I wanted to run for office and, and, and the people that was in office already told me that was the only spot for me. That was the only spot left. Everybody else had the other spots. So I said, I'll take that spot because sometimes it's important that you you get in the room. You may not be at the table, but get in the room. So as Sergeant of Arms, you know, I wasn't on the executive board, but I was at every meeting. I was meeting people at the door as they came into the room. I was shaking their hand and giving them the sign-in sheet and then they elected me as the assistant clerk craft director. So we have to, you know, get to know people. We have to know our elected officials. We have to get to know people from other unions. That is so important. And then you'll find out how much you have in common with other people. And don't stay in this comfort zone in your own union. It is so easy to say, well, yeah, they gave me a, a committee, a job to do, and I'm doing it well, and I'm working too. So, you know, I'm, I'm contributing. Stay, stay in, in your comfort zone will not let you grow. And we want to influence other people. We have the ability to know what's right. And we know what's right for women. Most of the men don't even know what's right for women. So we got to get in those spots so that we can tell them what's right. So prior to me um, being elected to legislative and political director of the American Postal Workers Union, I was the retiree director. It was an elected job and I was helping seniors. That was important to me, but we have to take chances too. I left that elected job ran for legislative and political director. If I had lost, I would have had nothing. I won. 
And then the hardest thing in the world for me to do, it didn't come natural. I didn't just learn it, is to go on the hill and talk to Republicans about issues important to working class that I looked up their record and they hadn't voted on one single thing in their whole career that was for, for, for us, for families or for women. And I had to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. And so I would like, you know, get all dressed up in my suits and I would catch a cab over to the hill. And then I would go into the bathroom and look in the mirror and pray. I said, you know, mom, you know, this person hate black people. It's clear because I've read some of his speeches on the hill and he don't like women. He voted against the, the uh, violence against women's rights. He voted against ERA. Uh, and now I have to go and have a meeting with him. And I would, you know, go in and I would meet with him. And, and my job is to lobby on postal issues. But my president, Mark Demonstein, allows me to lobby on all issues that impact the working class. So I would meet with them. Sometimes they would like, the meeting would last like five minutes, but it's important that we try to influence people on both sides of the aisle when we're lobbying. To pass laws, to help people, we got to talk to both sides of the aisle. To vote, get people to vote, you got to talk to people that are Republican, that never voted before, and that are Democrat. You got to talk to everybody. You got to, what we call it is, you got to find that common ground. There's a common ground. There's something that you have in common with that person. And I was easy for me to find the common ground because I used to be an arbitration advocate for my union. And you had to like do a lot of research and background on, on people. So um, before I meet with the person, I would research them, look at their bio. I said, mm, this person went to the University of Michigan. That's where I met Elise. I know a lot about the basketball team and the, and, and the University of Michigan, and that's where he went. So when I go in there to meet with him, I'm going to talk about the University of Michigan. And I talk about that for a few minutes. And next thing you know, he's not, he's not, and I say he because most of the members of Congress are men. He's not like looking at me strange. He's yeah, engaging in the conversation. So we have to find a common ground when we talk to people. Find it if you if you were just talking to another sister, the common ground might be our kids. Say, it's my understanding that you got four kids. How old are they? And the person might be a Republican. They might be someone that most people don't like. And next thing you know, you're in a full conversation with them. And then you could say, come on and go to this clue, a Zoom meeting with me next week. Here's the, I'll make sure you get the link. But you got to find a common ground with people. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, sister. So the first, the very first big issue for, for the postal workers that um, we had a vote on, it was USPS fairness. You had to make sure that, you know, you heard of this money uh, that the postal service has to spend to prefund their health care for retirees 75 years out. No other federal agency does that, no other private company does that. It's just stupid. When that vote took place last year on the Hill, there was 87 Republicans that voted with us. Lots of bills that you think is important to us, such as right now we believe that a reintroduction of the violence against women uh, at is important to women. Uh, you may not even be aware of the law expired in 2018. 
It doesn't exist. The, the law is not there to protect women. The Violence Against Women Act expired. And uh, it was just voted on in the House, the House of Representatives in D.C., and 29 Republicans voted in favor of it. And it passed. And we can't, we can't depend on one party. I believe in, we have permanent, we don't have any permanent friends when it comes to politics. We have no permanent enemies when it comes to the politics, just permanent issues, issues. So the Violence Against Women's Act is important. So if you want it to pass, you pick up the phone and you call the House of Representatives and then you call the Senate and you, you don't care whether you're talking to uh, you know, a Republican committee person or a Democrat, it's the issue. It's the issue that you could articulate so well because it's important to you. And then you have to watch how people vote that you elect. You can't just elect Democrats because they got a D behind their name. You got to like research how they have voted on the issues that's important to you. And when you Google it and you research it and you find out how they voted, uh, th then you'll learn that just because a person is a Democrat, that don't mean that they support the women's issues. That's right. Just because they're a Democrat, that don't even mean they support the working class issues. That's right. So having a D behind their name or R behind their name means nothing. It's the issue. And if you can relate to them on the issues, they may change their vote. Now, when we have these call your member of Congress, well, it's important that you help us because you are a lobbyist too and you can influence people. So it's important that you do help us, that you call, you make that call and you express your opinion. And the, if you've never did it before, you're not gonna talk to a member of Congress. I'm just be honest with you. They're not gonna come to the phone. You're gonna talk to a staff person and the staff person is a worker just like you. And they're gonna be polite. They're gonna listen to you and you have made a difference. Thank you, Judy. So it's easy. Wonderful. It's easy to lobby. It's easy to express your opinion on issues. If, if we didn't do that, the past laws would not have passed. The Family Medical Leave Act is important to all of us. It gives 12 weeks of unpaid leave to take care of a child or a newborn. Uh, a 12, 12 weeks, uh, 12 weeks is a lot. But in most countries, they have paid family leave. They get paid while they're taking care of their child. We don't have it in this country. So it's important that you lobby Congress on issues that's important to you, both sides of the aisle. Judy. Yes, yes sir. We have Nuri Martinez on right now from the LA City Council. I think with forgiveness of the membership here, let's go to Nuri Martinez because we're already speaking on mm -hmm. subjects that are actually at the 11 o'clock workshop. We'll come back out of the order of business. We'll go back to the liaisons and the video. But you okay. brought up so wonderful things. It would be a shame to cut it off, go to the program and come back. Let's organically follow this chain of thought. I'm going to introduce Nuri Martinez uh, for those sisters who uh, are unfamiliar with the, with the changes that have been going on in Los Angeles. She's uh, uh, a dynamic speaker, is fighting for workers' rights, advocate for women, uh, to, unprecedented for a, a Latina to be on the city council first and foremost and to be the president. She's actually her, her first. This is the first. So Nuri, thank you, sister, for being here. We call each other sisters because we're in this fight together. 
and I appreciate your time. I know you have to, uh, you have another commitment in uh, soon afterwards, but in any uh, thoughts and uh, things you can contribute to this portion of the program would be, would be very much appreciated. So you can unmute yourself as you wish. And I'm going to go ahead and call on Nuri Martinez. Thank you, Sister Judy. We'll continue this collaboration. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Adriana, for having me this afternoon, this morning, I should say. Uh, and I, I do apologize. I do have a really uh, tight schedule. I, I run a bunch of errands and I take care of a bunch of people. And so uh, I've got to get to my next appointment. But it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, I grew up in the community of Pacoima in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. And um, as a little girl, uh, when I was growing up, my mom was a seamstress and my father was a dishwasher. Uh, my father never drove a day in his life and he would take the bus from Pacoima to Sherman Oaks, if you're familiar with Los Angeles in the Valley. He'd take that bus every single day to get to work at five o'clock in the morning. And I remember as a little girl, my mother would say, you know, uh, we grew up across the street from this huge factory and we never really knew what, it, what they did there, but we just knew that it paid really well. And my mom would literally apply every single day for a job at this, at this factory right, off, right after she got off of work from her, um, for her seamstress job. And she was just determined to try to get that job. And she finally got in. And we finally found out really what they made. But, but the reason I tell this story is because it's really what, um, what, uh, why I, there was a calling for me to, to run for, for public office. My mother wanted that job because back in the 80s, when we used to make things in this country, people earned $15 an hour. People earned $16, $17 an hour making things in this country. In the Valley, we used to have the huge General Motors plant in Van Nuys where people made really good money. Families lived in the Valley because these jobs were here. And the factory that I'm referring to is Price Fister. And they used to make faucets, um, plumbing stuff. I don't really know how to describe it. And they used to pay anywhere between $14, $15, $16 an hour. But, but it was also a union job. And my mom um, really uh, believed in the union, the causes and the protections of a union. And so my mother became a teamster as a result of, of uh, literally applying for that job every single day. And the reason that's important is because when my mother got that job, it changed our lives completely. My father struggled with a minimum um, hour job, but the reason we had healthcare and the reason uh, we were able to pay our mortgage is because my mother uh, had health insurance. My mother had a, a pension plan. My mother had that teamster job that was protected by the union. One day I came home from high school and I found her crying in, in my parents' bedroom and I thought somebody had died. Um, and I just remember just feeling this, this sort of sense of helplessness. And I asked her what, what happened? And she said, the factory just announced that they were going to move. It was right in the, it was of the beginning of the 90s and uh, NAFTA had just been signed. And we started to hear people were panicking because some of these huge factories were moving to other parts of the world for cheap labor. And at the time, Price Fister had a lot of environmental issues uh, that they were getting fined for and the you know, state government was coming after them. So they found it very convenient um, to put a plan together to move the factory to Mexico and lay off almost 2,000 people. I grew up with a lot of kids who, whose parents worked there, both parents, and whose livelihoods depended on this factory union job. And so as a kid, I remember growing up with that anxiety of not knowing when my mom was gonna get laid off and whether we were gonna be able to pay the mortgage and pay, possibly lose our job. And so as a child, I don't think you ever really get over that anxiety and that fear that maybe your parents can't figure it out and maybe you're gonna end up on the street. And so I remember my mother um, with her broken English um, found out who her union representative was, wanted to know who the mayor of Los Angeles was because she wanted a meeting. And I remember having those women, those factory workers in my living room with my mother leading the charge to come up with hunger strikes, to come up with demonstrations. We would protest outside of the factory every single Saturday. And all these women would rally. And I love, you know, I, I love good men. And sometimes I'm married to a really good man. <laughs> and we love them. And we love our partners. 
But the women in that factory were the ones who were making it happen. And they fought for years. Eventually, the, the, they started to phase out the different departments in the factory. And eventually, the entire place shut down. And they eventually moved the entire factory down to Mexicali. But the reason I tell this story is why I'm so passionate about public uh, office and why I think so much, many more women need to follow in these and their passion of organizing and in their passion of fighting for their neighborhoods and their families, because that's what we do. We are multitaskers um, by nature. And, and I think, you know, when asked who my biggest hero is, it's my mother. It's my 83 year old mother who's still with us, um, who has never fought, um, lost a fight and who's never lost the will to fight for her community and for, for, her, um, for her family and, and our livelihood. And so the reason why we had a home and the reason we had health insurance is because of my mom. And eventually that job went away. And eventually a lot of these really good paying jobs in the San Fernando Valley went away because of these policies that were enacted. And because at the time factories thought that it was a lot cheaper to go to a different country and exploit uh, a different people for a product that they were making so much money for. So, you know, I've held three public offices in my public service career. I was um, a council member and a mayor of a small city, the city of San Fernando, which I served for approximately seven years. And then I was recruited to run for the second largest school district in the country, LAUSD. At the time I was seven months pregnant with my baby girl, Isabel, and I ran. And I had Isabel literally uh, three weeks before I ran, I won that election. And if you're running for office, uh, running, running while pregnant is probably not the best advice that I can give you, run, but running while you're pregnant is complicated. And so I won my election by almost 630 votes. And uh, in 2013, there was an opportunity for, my, for me to run for the city council. My friend who now serves in Congress, a Congress member, Tony Cardenas, if you're familiar with him, he had announced that he was going to leave his term early and there was an opportunity for, for me to run. I was running against other men at the time and one woman. And in 2013, I lost my primary election by 19 points. And the way it works in Los Angeles is if nobody gets more than 50% in the primary, you're automatically pushed into a runoff. It's, it's not winner take all, it's you have to get above that 50% threshold. And I didn't, um, and I kept uh, my opponent right under 50%, so we were automatically pushed into a runoff. I tell this story is because a lot of friends, a lot of people who I thought were my friends back in 2013, abandoned me. They simply left. They didn't think that I was gonna be able to come back from a 19 point deficit. And to be honest with you, I, I don't blame them. I mean, even if I was, uh, I love politics and I understand how this, how this, how this works. And if you are, if you were me uh, and, and I was, you know, and I was looking at you and saying, wow, you're 19 points down. I don't see how you turn this around. Um, I would have probably walked away from myself too. But you know what? I had an amazing group of, 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 of uh, what I call my sisters in, 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 in the fight. And I can count on them for pretty much anything. And I remember they picked me up and they said, you know, you gotta, you gotta keep fighting. And uh, I think I spent about four days in bed crying, just devastated because I had no idea how I was gonna be able to turn this around. And I remember my daughter came into, the, into my bedroom and I was crying and it was Memorial Day weekend. It was in May, Memorial Day weekend. I had just lost the primary. People are walking uh, away from me left and right. And she said to me, mama, do you still not feel good? You don't feel, you still don't feel better today? I said, no, baby girl, I don't feel, I don't feel good. I, I'm, I'm still not feeling well. And she said, and she was four years old at the time. She said, you know, mama, all we need to do is go to the mall, <laughs> go to the mall, go to the mall, buy a new pair of sneakers. We need to put those sneakers on. We need to get up and we need to try again. And my four-year-old's mind running for office meant that we were running a marathon. So she thought we were physically running and that I had lost the race because I came in last. And so in her mind, she's like, all you need to do is pour a new, buy a new pair of sneakers and we put them on and we keep running, we try again. And it sat with me. I just remember I got out of bed and I said, you're absolutely right. We're gonna go to the mall. We're gonna buy a brand new pair of shoes. And the next morning I grabbed my group of friends. We raised a little bit of money. We put a bare minimum campaign together and I walked every single day in the hottest day in the San Fernando Valley for two and a half months straight. And I won my general election by 10 points. And so this is the termination of women and women that come together. And since I've been on the city council, 
uh, you know, when I first got there and was elected in 2013, I was there for almost five years and I was the only woman on the council. People would often ask me what that feels like and what is that? And I go, I think it's embarrassing. The fact that you're the second largest uh, city in the country, you have one female representing the city council, and that's not even including the mayor, the city attorney, and the city controller who are citywide offices that are also held by three men. And so it took a while, but I got my friend to the north of me uh, to run for office. And then we got Monica Rodriguez elected. So now there's two women on the city council. And then just last year in November, a third woman got elected. So that, now there's three of us. But I've been very determined about the things that I, I'm committed to and working on when I'm um, as a member of the city council. I, I'm, I'm a huge champion of women's rights and equity issues for our city. Human trafficking is one of my primary issues where I cannot live with the fact that I am, I, I, I see 13 and 14 year old girls in my district being trafficked by men for sex and money. Um, Families First is a, is a family first agenda that I enacted back in January of last year when I became elected to, as LA City Council president by my colleagues where I want to dedicate and prioritize families and prioritize their livelihoods in the city and pay close attention about how we're passing, passing policies that actually impact our families in Los Angeles. And, and women in the workforce is something I am incredibly passionate uh, about. You know, women um, uh, in the workforce is now the lowest it has been in, since 1980s. We women have lost 5.4 million jobs since this pandemic began last year, with about 2 million dropping out of the workforce entirely. Two million women in this country have co just completely lost their entire livelihood. 46% of the working uh, women who've lost their, their jobs are, are, are women who, who, who make low paying wages. Uh, these are women who um, face every single day uh, the fact that they don't make enough money to sustain themselves, but also one of the primary reasons and one out of four women who have lost or basically uh, fell out of the work uh, workforce is because of childcare reasons. We just simply during this pandemic, women have had to bear the burden of carrying our entire families, our careers and making everything work because there's simply not schools to send our kids to and there's not adequate childcare to send your child to. So even if you have a job, you have to choose between your family and that job because simply there isn't anywhere to leave your kids with. And those are the kinds of sacrifices women have had to make over the last year. And if we go back to whatever normal is, normal cannot be where women carry the, carry the burden of taking care of everyone. It's simply not working. We were already stressed out to the point where we, we had to manage two or three jobs just to keep food on the table. We cannot go back to the way things were when we get back and we start to reopen our economy. I have been incredibly focused um, in using this COVID money from the federal government deliberately. Uh, and the council, I have pushed for childcare and we allocated $30 million to turning some of our neediest parks into alternative learning centers, where if families do have a job to go back to, you can drop your, your kids off at the park and they can actually log on to their class. There is a tutor on, on campus or at the park and it can help them through their, their virtual learning. And they can stay there until you get off of work and you can pick them up as late at six o'clock in, in the evening. We've done that for families. Childcare stipends where we've actually allocated money so that families can pay for a babysitter to take care of their children. Rental assistance, you've heard um, whether you read in the newspaper or in the media that people are having a really hard time paying for their rent, we've allocated to date $362 million to help families pay for their rent. Utility assistance, people are struggling to pay their gas bill, their phone bill, the Wi-Fi to actually keep kids in school. We've allocated $50 million towards that effort. And since the pandemic began, we enacted um, a paid sick leave for women and families where you can prov you are provided 80 hours of supplemental paid sick leave so that if you have someone who contracted virus or um, I'm sorry COVID or for whatever reason you've been impacted by COVID whether it be you or you're, a ca or you're caring for someone who has you're given 80 hours of supplemental paid leave. We've enacted um, you know 
uh, food giveaways, diaper giveaways. When this whole started, I had women and families calling me. They couldn't find diapers. They couldn't find baby formula. They couldn't pay for wipes. These are all things that women need every single day to be able to figure things out for their children. I put together huge events to be able to pass these essentials out. If we're going to return back uh, to whatever normal looks like after the pandemic, the status quo is simply not working, ladies. Uh, we need to enact policies that are, are going to expand paid uh, parental leave where women don't have to choose between staying home and bonding with their babies and their careers. You should never have to choose between your babies and a paycheck. You should be able to stay home and, and, and feel uh, safe that you're not going to get fired because you chose to stay an extra month, an extra two months with your child and you're getting paid for it. Expanding quality uh, uh, and affordable health, um, I'm sorry, childcare is incredibly important for us to return to the workforce. Fair compensation for women in the workforce has to be something we have to continue to fight for. Uh, creating stronger working protections and increasing work uh, place flexibility is important for women, especially if we're going to go back to work. All of a sudden, we have this global pandemic, and we've been able to figure out how to work from work, from home. We've been we've been spending decades trying to convince men to give us the flexibility to take care of our families. God forbid our child is sick, and there's a a, a supervisor who doesn't allow us to stay home because we have to take care of our kid. Well, guess what? COVID has now given us the ability to communicate with each other remotely and communicate with each other using Zoom and technology. Women should fight for those work, uh, workplace flexibilities so that we don't have to choose between a paycheck and taking care of our loved ones. Those are policies that we need to enact. And we need to be, have a more inclusive workforce for women. All of us need to be included in this fight if we're going to go back um, to our jobs. And I think that we cannot stop fighting for these policies at the state and federal level. Every chance we get to lobby for these types of policies, we need to continue to fight for those things. Those are just um, things that I've been sort of focused on since I've been the city council president and things that I am incredibly, incredibly dedicated to. We were very, um, uh, we were very uh, dedicated uh, when this pandemic broke uh, to ensure that people who had a job to go back to after we start to reopen the economy, like for example, hotel workers or janitors in some of these big uh, buildings in downtown, we enacted an ordinance called re uh, recall and retention, where because you have been laid off or you've been furloughed from your job, doesn't mean that if that job gets, uh, if that company gets sold to a different uh, a different uh, person or a different company, you shouldn't have to start from the bottom. You should be able to go back to that same job that you held before the pandemic hit. So for a hotel worker, if you were a housekeeper making $15, $16 an hour in a luxury hotel, and that hotel gets sold because it's not profitable anymore, and they bring you back to that job, you shouldn't have to reapply and you shouldn't have to start from the bottom. You have every right to go back to that job and keep your seniority and keep that same pay. Recalling retention is something we need to fight in, in the state of California. I've been working with Assemblywoman Lorena uh, Gonzalez and Assemblywoman Marielena Durazo. We need to pass this law. We need to make it law in California. Recalling retention is very important for our, for our workers and we need to ensure, ensure that continues to be uh, part of what we fight for. Uh, $15 an hour, if you if you follow the work in the city of Los Angeles, something that we enacted years ago because we fought for it. I let, I let that fight. And we need to ensure that we, we help our brothers and sisters in the federal government have the courage to keep pushing for that $15 an, an hour uh, wage increase. So sisters, um, I'm just here to offer uh, my support and, and, and call everyone, you know, this is really a call to action to ensure that we keep fighting for for what's right, but keep fighting for women's rights and women to be able to return to the workplace uh, uh, and that it's equitable and that it works for us and our families. Uh, running for office isn't easy, but we need more women in this fight and we need more women to run up and down the state of California to ensure that our issues are being voiced and that our causes are being fought for and that we have a seat at the table. You know, if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? It is our time to lead, our time has come. We've proven that with the presidential election. Women of color got this president elected, we can do it again. We flipped the Senate and we were gonna continue to hold people responsible, but it's up to us to mobilize and it's up to us to hold each other accountable. But more importantly, it's up to us 
to not forget that we have helped some amazing men get elected, we can get elected ourselves. Thank you so much for having me and allowing me to share my story. We're in this fight together. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Nuri. Yeah. Woo woo. Woo hoo. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Nuri. Have a good day. And thank, thank you so much. You. Thanks, Adriana. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. So we're going to uh, move on to the next speaker, Catherine Leibarger. Catherine, thank you for being here this lovely morning. How are things in Northern California? And thank you for joining the workshop. We're into the political action workshop now. Ladies, it's called Political Action, the Importance of Civic Engagement. Catherine is the next speaker in line. After we're done with this workshop, we're going to go back to what we uh, had to uh, pause on, go back to the liaisons, and then look at that video from Olivia. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Adriana, and um, good morning, good afternoon to all our sisters and siblings on the East Coast. Um, thanks for the warm welcome this morning. Um, really happy to be here with everybody. Um, my co-panelist, Nuri Martinez, is an incredible, inspiring person to try to follow. Um, but honestly, you know, the the inspiration really comes from the folks in this room and who are joining us um, via YouTube. Um, and a special shout out to you, Adriana, um, the hardworking California Clue president. Um, we've got a real leader in you. So uh, much appreciation, sister. Thanks. Um, stepping back a minute, you know, I've been thinking about the last week and um, I just, I have to say we're in an incredible moment. And I feel like I've been saying that um, every so often over the last few years. But, you know, this past week, we saw the passage of the American Rescue Plan Act, right? It's a law of historic proportion with the potential for addressing America's income inequalities in a way we have not seen in decades, um, Affordable Care Act aside. This past week, we also passed the one-year milestone of the pandemic. And as um, some of our sisters have raised, we also saw this past week, eight people, six of whom were Asian women, murdered in Atlanta. And this was just one week. And these were all political events that made plain, right, that politics is never generic, that we live in a political economy that touches each of our lives in very specific ways. So a few stats to consider. Um, I think that Nuri made some really important points about women in the work world and the impact the pandemic has had on us. Well, before the pandemic, the fastest growing demographic, demographic of the workforce was women aged 65 to 84. That's partly a result of the Great Recession in 2007, in which women had to cash out their 401ks just to keep their house or to send their kids to college. And as Nuri said, during this pandemic, women have lost work at a rate almost two times that of men. We are a majority of the population, but we are 48% of the workforce. And of that workforce, we are 60% of the low wage workforce. For black and brown women, this figure is even higher. And yet, on the other side, in the White House, we have the country's first female and black and South Asian vice president, and we have a record total 11 women, seven of whom are women of color who've been tapped to serve in the cabinet, right? Not everyone is doing so badly in this pandemic. The wealthiest men in the world have certainly gotten richer. They're doing fine but then unions are also doing better. At 65% approval rating, we are more popular than ever, and that's growing. As we see a historic union vote happening this month in Bessemer, Alabama, at an Amazon fulfillment center belonging to that richest man in the world. So taken together, then what does this mean for all of us and for what our tasks are? as union women in California in this political moment. Everyone here in this Zoom room, everyone here in this conference knows firsthand, right, how much 
work it took to inaugurate a new day on January 20th. We know it wasn't luck, but it was the exercise of our power that put Biden and Harris in the White House and that ensured that we have a Congress that can be pushed to represent our interests. It ain't automatic, we know that, but that we have a Congress that can be pushed. So I think what this moment makes clear is that our work matters. And that as we, working people, working women, have created the conditions for progressive change. Our project of building our power is as urgent as it ever was. I like what Elise started out with, what she said when she said, there are men in powerful places who are afraid of our power. Well, isn't that the truth? <laughs> there is a difference between authority and power. Authority is the power we all agree to follow. It's, our, it's the kind of power that our elected leaders wield. The power is the ability to exert our will over another. Most elected leaders, most of these men who are afraid of us, and actually too many of us confuse authority with power. But we're all union leaders here. And to be a union leader is to believe in the power of working people to exert our will over our bosses or over our elected leaders. There is no other way for working people to have power other than by sticking together and pressing our demands and using every possible lever we have to win them. So I would say that political action starts first with building our union's power through taking direct action. I love the story that Nuri told about her mother and all those workers hitting the picket line day after day to prevent the closure of their factory. We don't always win, but there are important victories that we have in the process of trying and sometimes we do win. My union, which has membership that is majority black, indigenous people of color and women, has struck in every one of our last four contract cycles and each contract cycle becoming increasingly drawn out, multi-year battles, but with us winning all of our core demands as a result. And so when we got state budget language last year that shores up the job security rights in our new contract, it's because legislators and our boss knew that we would make good on our promise to fight until we won it. Another thing is that we're stronger when we don't fight alone, but with our members' communities, right? So looking back at Bessemer, Alabama, the retail workers union that's organizing those Amazon workers has allied with Black Lives Matter and other organizations fighting for racial justice because 85% of these Amazon workers are black and unionizing is a racial justice fight. We build power when we know that our members, what our members and their communities want, right? And when we spend our union's resources in the fight for those things that may seem outside the scope of workplace issues, things like affordable housing, affordable health care, student debt forgiveness. You can't swing a dead cat in a room without hitting somebody who either has student debt themselves or whose kid has an incredible amount of student debt. Or for my members, following on a history of campus police profiling, my union is fight profiling our members, my union's fighting alongside the students on campus for police reform at the University of California. We also build power when we bargain for the common good. For example, teachers unions, UTLA, Chicago teachers, St. Paul teachers, they've organized deeply in their schools communities, gaining community support for the things that teachers need while raising demands at the bargaining tables such as establishing a legal defense fund to stop the deportation of students or having school districts divest from banks that foreclose on the school district's families' homes. We can't afford to follow politics. We have to lead in politics. Statistically, 
more pro-woman and pro-family policy gets made when there are more women in office to make those policies, right? Union memberships should consider running their own women leaders for office. And so when your membership comes to you and says, we need someone to run and we need you to run, what did I hear recently? It takes one time uh, for a man to be asked to run for him to decide. It takes seven times for a woman to be asked to decide to run. One thing I appreciate, appreciate about women's leadership and women's process is that we are collaborative, that the work is not about us, that we do look to the support and do the work for the sake of the work itself and not for ourselves. And it's that kind of leadership that is so impactful in office. We have to legislate to build power, get laws passed that support organizing and workplace rights. And I could go on and on, but I think the things that Nuri Martinez spoke of are great examples led by who else? Labor women who hold office now in the assembly and the Senate. We have to hold electeds accountable, especially those who don't automatically march alongside us. It's not enough simply to get them into office. This goes especially for us here in California where we have a two thirds Democrat majority in the legislature, but we haven't begun to tap the incredible wealth in this state to fund our schools. Just, you know, it's been a long slog. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not talking about us working harder and burning out but instead of finding the ways to step up that we know can sustain and that sustain us. And it's about staying focused on what works. This means that we continue to look to each other because we're the ones who make the conditions for our elected leaders to do great things. It's not the other way around. And at the end of the day, all we have is each other. And that is enough. That's phenomenal. It is what has created this moment of possibility. And it's what we need now more than ever. It is what's our power. Thank you so much. Yay, thank you, sister. That was great. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. We're rising to the occasion, sisters. You've heard dynamic speakers so far. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for staying on. And we're moving on from Catherine on to the next speaker of the day, which is Leticia Munguia. Leticia from Southern California. Leticia, are you going to uh, log into which account so I can unmute you. I think you can uh, do so on, uh, on your own. And I appreciate you for being here too, representing uh, San Diego. And Becky Hunt from the San Diego chapter. She's going to uh, now take over the session and we're gonna go into Q and A following Leticia. You okay there, Leti? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can, my dear. There you are, front and center. Si se pueden, eres presente. Presente. Go ahead, Leticia. Well, good morning, uh, hermanas. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, my name is Leticia Munguia. I was born and raised here in San Diego. Uh, I'm before you, uh, and I'm so just thankful to our national president, Elise, but more importantly, I want a big round of applause for Adriana. Uh, she has been outstanding and a fabulous uh, president for us here in California. Um, I'm honored and humbled to be before you. I see some similar faces. A big shout out to Marty Harris, my colleague when I was with CSEA. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, sisters from other a work that we've done. So my name is Leticia Munguia. I was born and raised here in San Diego. I'm a product of public education. For the last 30 years, I've been organizing in our community, black, brown, people of color, underserved parts of San Diego County. And I'm proud to be before you as a candidate for the state assembly in the 79th. I want you to know that I literally, when Nuri Martinez was speaking, my heart was like, 
completely in alignment with her story. And let me tell you why. My mother was a cannery worker and she was a production line worker at Jack in the Box. She did onion rings for 16 years of her life, right? And my dad was a member of Local 89, which is our laborers. He was a gardener and a landscaper, both of them with a, a primary grade education. And I'm here before you today, not only as a product of San Diego Unified, I went to City College, then I went to San Diego State, and then I was blessed to go to law school, everyone. I'm a Juris Doctorate serving my community. And I think it's important that you hear the story. As a Latina, as a daughter of immigrants from Mexico, I stand proud on the shoulders and on the work of many. And so I have been, in, people have invested in me as I have then turned around and invested in my community. And so as a candidate for the 79th, I want you to know this. Many years ago, there was an opportunity for us to create the Clue chapter in San Diego. And I'm proud of, to tell you, you know, the theme of today's panel is civic engagement. I have been engaged for 30 years. I also know one of our sisters here, Becky Hunt. We met at a table doing organizing work with our labor council here in San Diego. So I wanna give you all an opportunity to think about this. The theme is civic engagement, right? I'm an organizer. And when I had to make a decision on what my ballot designation would be, what is it? Community organizer, because this is what we do day in and day out. So I stand before you sisters in the courage to take on this race. We have 17 days to go in this election cycle. It's a special election. And I have to tell you, every day we're hitting doors, dialing, and we're also making sure that we're fundraising, right? Um, know that there's five candidates in the race. It's a very challenging race, right? As a Latina, nothing has ever been easy for any one of us. And today I want you to know this. I am determined to stand with our API community, our brothers and sisters who've been harmed. My partner is a Korean American. And he has been himself under a lot of scrutiny. So today I need you to know that my passion to speak up for justice and for workers and for women of color and for all of you, my Clue sisters, is now more determined than ever. And I want you to know that I stand on the shoulders of many. I've been endorsed by SEIU California, by CSCA, by laborers, by our Teamsters, by my AFSCME union family here in San Diego, District Council 36 and Local 127. Working families are standing with me in this race because we have to have an advocate for working families. We gotta be able to have folks with courage to speak up about injustice, right? And today I tell you my civic engagement and how I became involved, somebody asked me to be involved. So we have to remember to always ask and engage our workers, our friends, and our community, right? It's by having those conversations that are so absolutely important. Many years ago, when I started to see that there was no tutoring at the local community uh, center that I was attending as a child, um, I asked. And they, the director at the time said to me, her name is Estela Rubalcaba for the Sherman Heights Community Center. And Estela said, you want something? Do something about it. Start the tutoring program yourself. So I did. And that was the beginning of this story of why I'm before you now as an assembly member candidate. And I'd, I'm not here alone. I shared the story with the planning committee that I, Adriana hosted a couple days ago. I was asked, I got a phone call. I was enjoying like as best as we could in this COVID setting. I got a phone call and they said, have you thought about running? And I said, who? Look to my right, I look to my left, I look to my side and I said, me? I'm always, we're always working on getting someone else selected, right? That's what we have always done. But when I got the call about running, I took it under advisement. I did a lot of processing and I said, am I ready? Am I the one, is this the time? Just like Nuri said, everything Nuri was saying was registering with me because it's very lonely. It's very lonely, everyone. So this morning I'm sharing with you that I'm on fire. I'm thankful to Adriana who reached out to include me in the panel 
this has been a lonely road, but I will tell you this. We have 70 days to go to victory. It's a primary. It's top two, right? And so know that I'm committed to making sure that working families, a union family, the union voices are, in, are part of this campaign. It's been part of my commitment from day one. I have to respect the, the history of my parents, their contributions to the fabric of our local community and our society. So for me, when we talk about civic engagement, you know, yes, we have historically, historically thought about civic engagement in the context of voter registration, getting out the vote. But right now you have an opportunity to be involved in something that's extremely important. And that's the redistricting of our communities. There's an opportunity for us to provide comment. There's an opportunity for you to send in your opinion. It's an opportunity for us to stay in dialogue about where we're going to be counted in this redistricting process. For me, it's always been about having a voice to be engaged, an opportunity to make sure change happens, but it won't happen if we are not involved. That's why I decided to run. Representation does matter. And this community where I was raised in, it's an opportunity for me to be a voice. And that's what I've been committed. I've done this work alongside Becky and Marty and many of you, Susan, I see Susan, my sister Susan from the San Diego chapter. And so I will tell you, my commitment has always been, if there's not a seat at this table, I'm gonna bring my own chair. And I want you to know that we need to take a look at how we do our work and continue to be inclusive, continue to allow an opportunity. If you don't know the person, it's okay. We have to have that opportunity to engage, include, and in making sure that we have representation. Think about boards and commissions at the state level, at the county level, at the city level. Right, we have to have a, we have to be represented, and my commitment has always been: it's not just about me, it's about us, it's about our story, and it's about our story that needs to be told. The day when we go to the ballot here on April the sixth, this primary is seventeen days away. So I'm asking for your support. Some of you, I think, I re reached out directly. But I'm going to ask for a small contribution if you can. This race is very difficult. And I want you to know that I won't make it alone. So I would ask for your support in any way you can, even if you can offer an hour of dialing. My team will get back to you. I'm engineered, empowered by women. This, my candidacy, my team is women focused. I want to create an opportunity for women to learn how to do this work and how to build capacity so we can run other women in races. That's what we need to do. We wanna be able to have a voice in Sacramento in every possible place we can. So without further ado, I just wanted to share with you that I'm here on the shoulders of many. And I will also share this. Uh, Nuri Martinez mentioned two women that not only endorsed me, but they called me to run. And that's Senator Maria Elena Durazo. A, she's a powerhouse. And you know what? I met her 15 years ago when I was working for CSCA. And we did a march downtown LA and we met one day. And that relationship has been solid. Women leading in the labor movement. So I need you to know that we, we are here together and we are, we are a fabric of our ability to lift each other up. Your theme for today's conference is rise. We rise together, sisters. We have to. It's incredibly important that we not only lift each other up, but that we sustain each other. I heard that in Nuri, Nuri's message this morning. The other part of this is that we have to be engaged to ensure that our democracy is strengthened. Just like I stand today, is with our API brothers and sisters in this most horrible, tragic situation. We need to call out the attacks. We need to stand in solidarity with them. And to all of our sisters that are API on this call across the country, I'm with you. 
I got you and I will speak up about you because it's the right thing to do. And I will ensure that every single message I give this weekend when I'm talking to voters, that they know we're standing together. Civic engagement is only a click away, a letter away, a phone call away. It's about making sure that we are engaged, that we're delivering a message of unity, and that we continue to do this advocacy work that all of you have always done. And I thank you this morning for allowing me to share my story and know that we have 17 days to go. If you can give a small contribution, I'm thankful and I'm honored to have this opportunity to be before you. President, Madam President, Elise and Adriana, thanks so much for the opportunity to share my story and on to victory, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lethe. Best of luck in the election. Uh, as Thank Clue, you. we support you spiritually, in our minds, in our hearts. We can't endorse you officially because we're, we're not allowed as a constituency group to do that. But I do encourage sisters to follow your campaign offline to be able to follow you to the finish line, to carry you on our shoulders, to get you to your goals, to where you need to be, sweetheart. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you again for participating. I'd like to highlight some San Diegans here. Hello, San Diego. Hello, Susan. Hello, Becky. Hello, other members. Thank you for being here. This is your workshop. This is for you. And thank you for selecting it. As you heard, sisters, members nationwide, politics. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's part of our mission statement, too, in helping those sisters to get to where they need to be to help us in return. I'm going to go back to Judy Beard in a minute because I, 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 I know that she had some final comments on that subject, but I'd like to introduce your moderators. Tamika Cook, if she's here, and Becky Hunt. Thank you for taking on the leadership role of championing this workshop. It's essential, a, a topic of conversation that's not always well heard, but so, so important to not forget. Let's not uh, take a back seat because we have uh, certain positives, individuals of candidates that won office in the Senate, the House of Representatives, and in higher office, never ending struggle to maintain what is required, irrespective of your, uh, of your party. This is not a party issue. And I, I, I'm gonna go to Judy for that in a minute. It has to do with policy, it has to do with supporting what you already have and earned and people died for in these contracts, in these bargaining, your CBA even the bylaws, even the Roberts rules, all of these things, even the, the five day work week, uh, child labor laws, all of these things. If you haven't taken a labor studies course, I encourage you to do so. There's, there's a lot of history that goes into us. Many lives lost, many workers injured, maimed, many uh, homeless, many challenges even now in 2021 because of COVID. Uh, living paycheck to paycheck before COVID was a challenge and now, not having been unemployed for a long period of time, it's an added struggle. So I'm gonna to go to those sisters. I'm gonna have Becky Hunt uh, go to questions and answers right now, but I'd like to go back to Judy. Judy, why is it so important to participate in, in these actions that Clue sends us, in these action alerts that wonderful off non diligently does that for our benefit? Tell me about that. Explain to me. So um, Clue is a nonprofit organization and you know, our membership dues are, you know, very small and we get most of our funding from the AFL-CIO and they require us to do a report to them as to, you know, what work we have actually done. So to keep that funding coming, it's important that we grow Clue we get more members so that there's more dues money to pay for things. And I really, really commend the sisters that are running for office right now. Uh, it's hard to ask people for money. So you have to, you know, you know that, you know that. And especially when you don't even know the person, ah, let's make sure that we leave this, this conference 
making sure that those people that are fighting for us, we got your back. You, you need to make sure they know that we got your back. It makes a person really feel good when they're out there passing out literature or they're at home. They're just at home making phone calls and they get a call from someone and say, hi, I'm from your name, your union. And I just wanna let you know, I got your back. If you got some literature, I can come by and pick it up from somewhere and I'll help pass it out. It's important that we got your back and give us strength to keep going, give, give us strength to rise. Thank you. Essential, help one another to get to where we need to be so that they can help us in return, right? Very simple concept, always difficult, especially across party lines, but we're workers, we're in unions or not, just like Nuri Martinez had mentioned, the basics, $15 an hour. I can't believe we're still talking about that so many years later, and it's not a consideration. How do we support our families? How do we support each other? Your, your talents are, are well compensated with these contracts. So just keep that in mind. How, however, uh, whatever legislation comes up, that's what we champion. And we'll support people like Leticia who, who, who pick up the gauntlet, go with it forward. And the Nuri's Martinez's of the, of, of our, the future generations are there for us because that's who's going to be voting us and helping us and championing us when we're retirees. That's not too far away for, for me, uh, but I certainly agree that, you know, save my Medicare, save my social security, save my benefits, save my pensions, the ones that I worked for 20 years for, right? We, we, we want to be able to hold on to the things that we fought for. How do we do that? By keeping these policies alive. As Judy's sister had said, these things expire. They need, they need to be renewed. Um, I think it's important to identify the future generations of, of clue women leaders like Marilyn and Afnan and, and others like Olivia and uh, Magali and soon to speak uh, uh, guest speakers in the, in the immediate sea of the next hour or so. It's important to highlight that they need our shoulders and they need us to, to be their mentor, mentee and to encourage them and to say that, you know what, my, my, I put in my time in this effort, but I want you to support you to carry on the legacy. We talked about that last night, carrying on the legacy of what everyone's done. Susan Orlowski doing wonderful things, championing women, being a mentor to those in her chapter. Char Gonzalez is a, a very well meaning the mother of our chapter who encourages us and holds us accountable. Darn tootin', yes, she does because she says, this is how I did it. And this is how I want you to do it so you can help someone else, right? So let's go to Q and A. We have wonderful speakers who are still with us, Catherine and Leticia. And then we heard from Nuri. What would you like to ask the panel of sisters? And we have also Judy and Elise to contribute as well. So raise those hands and how do you do that? You go down to reactions and under reactions, you're gonna see a toggle. It says raise hand. If you'd like to ask a question, put it in the chat. And if you'd like a question answered offline, certainly please email us and we'll get that to the individual. So dynamic, dynamic. I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna segue over to Becky now. Becky Hunt, please ask the, uh, the panelists here and your, your co-host now, honey. Uh, I Hi. see, and let's go to that person. Go for it, Becky, and thank you, Leslie, for and, and Danae for monitoring those questions and bringing it to the panelists, too. Really appreciate your input. Hi, sisters. I'm Becky Hunt. I am from the San Diego chapter. I am also a uh, machinist, uh, International Association of Machinist retiree member. Uh, a little bit about me is um, I'm second generation uh, union. Uh, my dad was a part of the UAW Local 506 here in San Diego, which I would later uh, hire on um, uh, in my early 20s as a single parent. Um, I would go on to become recording secretary before the plant closure. 
So I, I know all too well that aerospace has been leaving this country for a long time now. And um, I am a byproduct of two plant closures. So um, anyway, I have taken advantage of the uh, re-education and, um, and also a new union job at uh, for the machinist union. So I, I worked um, for a place called Hamilton Sundstrand, which was represented by the IIM. And I was more than happy to join because I've been a UAW member for 14 years, which helped me raise my daughter as a single parent, helped me purchase a home because I had livable wages and health care. And so that, that's why I believe that when you work union, you live better. And um, I'm grateful for that. I would stay single into my 30s because I was self-sufficient and very independent. Um, anyway, I uh, became a, uh, um, a, I sat on e-board at, um, for the uh, local lodge 1125 here in San Diego. I, I was vice president for about five years and um, time came for change in our, in our local lodge and I decided is now the time to run. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever ran for office in your union, but it's not an easy task. And I had put my hand in at the last minute. So some of the fellows were kind of like, uh, well, you didn't tell us, so we're not gonna support you. But I really felt that this was the time. And anyway, so we went to uh, an election and there were shen some shenanigans and I ended up filing for protest, which uh, we did a re-election and I became president. And I would continue on to be president, um, was supporting my e-board for three years. And it was the uh, um, best three years of my life um, growing in this, um, in this unity, solidarity, and fellowship of the union. And um, that's how I, I um, got out into the community and met Leticia and supporting the community. Well, since I'm no longer the president, I have gone on to be in some leadership roles right here in San Diego. I sit on the, uh, in my community, the rec center. I am a part of that board now. And I'm also in the planning group for my area, which is Linda Vista is where I live. And um, so I became a CLU member about two years ago um, because uh, they were at my labor council meeting because I was a delegate being a, a activist, you find your hats in your hand in many hats. <laughs> So I, I've been out in the community a lot, a lot. And, you know, they talk today a lot about um, women's working, you know, and, and through all of these years, I've always heard working people, working people. And I can really relate because I've been a union member and, um, you know, but not all working issues are women's issues. And I, as I've seen through the past few years that, you know, they're trying to roll back the clock on some issues. And that's kind of scary because I grew up in a time where, you know, we could vote, we were independent, we could work hard and we could earn and we could have buy our own house. We can do things, you know, and um, for, for uh, some of uh, the last presidency, trying to roll back some of those rights was really scary for me. So I'm so grateful for the women that spoke today you know, like finding a seat at the table. And I kind of feel like, you know, sitting on my e-board was my seat. And now I'm sitting in the community seats learning from these great individuals. Like I'm learning today from the ladies here, you know, um, Elise, uh, thank you for, um, you know, you, you're singing to us. And my granddaughter heard you and she's been a student on Zoom and she hasn't heard any singing on Zoom. And she goes, oh my gosh. Who's singing? Why is she singing? She has a beautiful voice. And so thank you. You know, it's like expanding my thinking and also my granddaughter's thinking. And um, also, um, too, um, I, I had jotting, jotting down uh, a few more uh, notes. Oh, yeah. And um, Leticia was talking about, um, about running for office. And, you know, the Machinist Union um, for about... I'd say about five to eight years now, they're like, come on, let's get uh, working people, you know, to run for office. And now what I'm hearing today is let's get women with working, you know, thoughts going on in the office to represent the whole, the whole uh, working class, you know, women, uh, working people, Asians, um, you know, and that just totally, um, broaden my horizon too. 
And um, one of the words that really came to heart for me was solidarity forever. And um, I thank you sisters for the solidarity today. And um, totally speaking right now is out of my comfort zone. <laughs> And I am grateful for that. Um, you know, I grew up in a time where what happened in your home stayed in the home. So this is really hard for me. Um, but I'm starting to come out of that comfort zone and also have been being the president for three years that helped me also. And um, I support you ladies. And I am so glad we got some ladies here that are running. Um, some, sometimes in my heart, I feel like I need to run, but I am clueless on doing that. So hearing the leadership here, um, going to, um, you know, giving their all to the next generation. You know, that's what we're doing. We're trying to fight for, uh, to be able to survive in the next generation. And I am so grateful for that today. And um, anyway, with that, um, like uh, Adriana said, if you have questions for our panelists that were here today, um, just please raise your hand. Um, there's not that many of us. so. Uh, we'll go on that order when you raise your hand, and I'd be happy to call on you on that order. There is a question that came in from uh, the email. I put it in the chat for you, Becky. All right, and we do have a hand up. Okay. I do not see that question yet, so we'll go to the hand. Yep. Um, Tish, you may have the floor. Just go ahead and unmute. Hi, ladies. I'm speaking on my iPhone. For some reason, I'm not able to hook up on my Mac, but I want to take this opportunity to um, thank Miss Judy Beard. I've known Judy since my first training through my APWU union was with Judy Beard, probably in, 20, in 2001, when she worked with Paul Ellis, a very, we're both very wonderful wonderful trainers. And Judy, this is the time I want to commend you on always sharing and training. Every time you speak, I learn something. And I'm sure all the other women can say that and the men at the union conventions and trainings. But this is the time I felt comfortable on a Zoom with, you know, maybe 50 women, whereas where I've been to trainings and it's been such a room full of people that I, I don't think my voice is that important, but I think I want to take this moment to thank Judy because she continues to train people and her heart inside and out. She's a beautiful woman outside and inside. She has a heart for the people. And um, I just want to thank you, Judy, right now to uh, this is where I want to thank you, Judy. And Elise, I love the singing. When we see you at our union, APWU conventions, conferences, we always have time for this singing. I said, oh, okay, we're going to sing. Good. We need that. Thank you, ladies. That's all I want to share. Love right. you. Thank you, Tish. That was great. Um, we do have a question for Catherine in chat. It is, can you share some of the challenges of being in higher office in the California Labor Fed? That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, you know, some of the challenges are what uh, I think should sound really familiar to um, probably most of the women in this meeting. I think being, and this is, you know, with much respect for my union brothers, um, uh, I think most of us have probably sat through a meeting where um, maybe not overtly, but um, just out of um, unexamined assumptions. Um, one of your brothers will say something or raise something that just sort of reinforces um, the, the stereotypes and attitudes that people have about women and our place in, in decision-making powerful um, environments. Um, you know, we, uh, as the president of, uh, uh -huh. as the president of the executive uh, council, um, you know, I, part of my job is not to weigh in all the time, right? It's really about facilitating uh, a meeting that 
gets a discussion going to the best place that we can possibly be. But there are moments when, you know, you've got to speak up and you can't hold back. And um, right after the Janus decision, and just folks will probably remember that was the Supreme Court decision that basically said that the entire public sector um, in the United States essentially um, is right to work. And workers have a right to um, not pay union dues for the union that represents them. And so it, you know, it was a huge crisis for all of labor, public sector especially, and we got into this debate at the executive council and uh, you know, someone brought an idea that I thought was actually really, really um, objectionable. And uh, I argued hard for it um, in a way that's not characteristic for me because of my position. And you know, to hear um, to hear a counterpoint made saying that, well, it is naive to think such and such and such. And, you know, having to come back and say you know, that, no, in fact, I'm not naive. It is not naive to proactively raise your dues, to get your members to agree to raise their dues to protect their union. And then afterwards have to check in with a very small handful of women in the room, say, did he just call me naive? Is, I mean, that's a woman thing, right? Like women are naive, right? Would he ever have called a brother naive? Argue with me, but choose your words better, right? It's challenging to be in these rooms, I'm sure as we can all relate, where um, uh, women make up maybe a quarter of the people sitting around the room. And it's not just, you know, challenging on a personal level, but I think it's a challenge for all our memberships because I think, um, you know, representation matters and uh, women's voice really matters and that um, it's that when we're heard, we make a substantial contribution to making better ideas um, and better rounded ideas that move us all forward. So I would say that that's the challenge. All right, thank you, Catherine. Um, we do have a hand up. That's Marty Harris. You're unmute and ask away. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Um, I I guess this is more like a request from Leticia Mangia. I have full faith that she's going to get elected, and I would like to urge her that um, what is going on right now. We both work to get. We had worked together before. And um, I represent the classified employees in the state of California, which are the staff workers at the schools who don't have a teaching credential. However, I want to talk about the fact that a lot of things start at the bargaining table and um, Zoom is not gonna go away. It's only gonna get better. And I see the challenges that young women that I represent have with regards to childcare. Currently the schools are going back and yes, I know it's only current right now, but the schools are going back in what's known as a hybrid model. And the hybrid model will bring back 50% of the students, 50% of the time. Then the rest of the time, they'll come to school on Monday and Tuesday. The second group, the other 50% comes on Thursday and Friday. Wednesdays is for intense, disinfecting. The rest of the time, this group number one will be distance learning. The challenge is for my instructional assistants who have to physically come to school to help teach the children, but yet they've got school-age children that are staggered and coming to school, but then staying home. And the school districts are telling them, if you can't come to work, then tender your resignation. This is America and it needs to be better than that. So what I'm asking is that Leticia or any elected official start thinking about a voluntary basis where they can work from home. It was okay when the schools were shut down for them to work from home. Now they want them physically back, but the challenge is if they have school-aged children, they don't have that ability. So no one in America should be faced with do I abandon my children or do I abandon my job? That's unthinkable. So I'm urging for her to think along those lines and she can get a hold of me. I have some ideas 
where we can make legislation so that it's voluntary so that people that don't have the ability to come to work will be able to do so. So um, that's all I wanted to say. Just wanted to provoke some thinking along those lines. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Marty. Okay, we have another question from the chat. It says, um, what about hosting, hosting a workshop at the national level to train women in public policies we need to support this year? And for Judy, sorry, that's for Judy Beard. What about hosting a workshop at the national level? Uh, Judy had another engagement. She had to leave the meeting, but is our sister Elise still here? Maybe. Absolutely. Once <laughs> again, we're, we're thinking on the same lines. Absolutely. We will um, work on that. I'll take that to the education committee and it's, it's done. So I'm going to, that question's in the chat room. So I want to make sure I, I get it. Copied. Yeah, you got another question. It says, can Clue Sisters endorse not neighbor friendly candidates on social media? Can you identify what as Clue we can do? You can do anything you want as an individual, but you cannot do that as a Clue member. You cannot endorse a political candidate. I don't care what party they belong to. Don't put your, don't put your Clue t-shirt on me talking about I'm supporting Boo Boo. No. You know, take your T-shirt off, put your union T-shirt on. You can do anything you want. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, we have another question for Judy Beard. Oh, she, Judy's gone. Can you answer this one, Elise? Oh, okay, no, this is saying that she left, sorry. Okay. Right, are there any other questions? Does anybody have their hands up? Oh, we do. Leslie, you got the floor. Unmute my audio. <laughs> I think you'd learn after a year how to unmute mute quickly. <laughs> uh, morning, sisters. Uh, great conversation. It's more like an observation, but you know, Catherine, Elise, anybody can um, uh, respond or or expand on my thought, which is just a, a common thread that I've heard this morning and often is the um, with elected women, women in leadership is the personal stories, um, the how they were raised, how um, things in early life have impacted them to have them run for office or be in a leadership position. Um, and to an extent, I think that's why Biden was elected because he shows empathy and he's had these life experiences as well that we can all relate to. Uh, same with uh, Kamala, um, you know, being raised by a, basically by a single brilliant mother. Um, and I think um, I was just, you know, I, th I think just my comment is that we need to have more of those women that, you know, their North Star is their life experience, because that's how things get done, I think. <laughs> I think, I think uh, um, just uh, uh, people can relate better when there's that personal story there that they can relate to and put the politics to the side and really, you know, this is how we rise, right? You know, uh, being able to find that commonality. And I think that um, Sister Elise was kind of touching on that uh, this morning too with her talk. Um, but that was just a, a comment, a observation, uh, expand on it as you will. Uh, but I think it's really important. All right, thank you so much for the questions and answers and to our panelists. It was huge learning experience and very inspirational. And now I will turn it back over to Adriana for continue on. Thank you, sisters. Thank you to the panelists and speakers and all volunteers who made this workshop possible. Thank you, San Diego, for hosting the workshop. We appreciate the chapter leadership, Tamika Cook, the vice presidents, the officers, the committee members, and the San Diego members and uh, non-union members as well, associates, retirees, and students from that chapter. Thank you for those San Diegans that are here right now in this session to support your, your uh, Southern California members and also Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San, uh, Sacramento as well. We care about you and if you need anything, I see that wearing your swag representing. Thank you, Marty. So where are we going now? We're gonna go back just briefly if I may, because I had to interrupt the programming to accommodate a panelist.
We have three wonderful women in the state of California who help us, three. There should be more, but they do so much for us. I'd like to uh, give a big thank you and a round of applause to Benny Bridges, Jennifer Grisby, and Sh uh, Shyla Lachey. So we have some wonderful slides. We're gonna go to them. We'd like to have you speak sisters uh, for a few minutes and uh, please say hello to your delegation for California. We'll go with Benny first. Benny, if you're still here, honey, you just have to uh, unmute yourself. Thank you for holding on. We can come back to you. All right, let's go Good on. Good afternoon to, to all my sisters. Um, thank you, Adriana. And it's been a wonderful program so far. I mean, I really appreciate all that you and the California State Committee that planned this um, seminar. And I know a lot of work went into it. Um, I appreciate working with you guys and I am available to do whatever I can for the chapters that I am the liaison for the San Francisco chapter, which I joined after my chapter disbanded and the uh, Sacramento Capital chapter, which Ruth Ibar is doing a fantastic job. And Vicki Wiki is over the uh, San Francisco chapter. So I wanna thank all of you for the work that you're doing and um, let's keep it going. And if you need me, I my email, uh, is Bridges BR. That's all one word at AOL.com. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. It's Bridges BR, not ER. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. It's no problem. We'll change change that right now. B R I D G E S B R. B is in boy, R's and Roberts. Right. Roberta at AOL.com. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, sister. Care about you. You've been uh, an inspiration to me too and appreciate our chats. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. My sister from Los Angeles, Jennifer Grisby, sisterhood. Hello, everyone. Um, this has really been as, as Benny said, so far it's been a great conference. Uh, I'm looking forward to our next conference. I wanna thank all the committee members who worked so hard to make this a reality. And I also am available if anyone needs assistance. My email is jlgrigsby1 at gmail.com. Thank you. Is that good in the chat, Jennifer? I can I can type it in the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, sister. Shyla. Hi, Shyla. Hello, greetings, peace and blessings. I am so encouraged and empowered by this. The breakout session was so informative. Like at first we were rolling along, but as it got harder we realized, wow, these are some women that we didn't know. So we, you know, had some people to look up and look into, but I too have appreciated, I'm so appreciative of this conference, of the knowledge that's being spread, of the encouragement and empowerment that's being passed along. And this is what we all need to just energize ourselves and to keep going and moving forward because we know that what we're doing is important but it does get hard at times and just coming together and sharing in our sisterhood and hearing the stories and the paths that we're all taking does so much to keep us going and although I'm not one of the liaisons for any of the California chapters of course we're all here um, if anything is needed so my email is clued at shyla at gmail.com and um I think my phone number is probably out there, but it's 213-985-2557 if anyone needs to contact me for any reason. But um, yes, I am loving this. Thank you so much, Adriana, for bringing together for all of the 
uh, sisters who have made this possible because it is always a team effort, but this is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience. I'm looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Shyla. Please put those details in the chat for the sisterhood to be able to reference to later. Thank you, Benny. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. I will do that. So uh, Olivia Guevara, she's going to be in part two of the session. We're going to go into an intermission, intermission in a minute. It's going to we'll be back at 1.30. But I wanted to highlight a video that we showed. Uh, things uh, have been turning for the worse since COVID. You know, we had a lot of protests in terms of race. And it still continues on now. It's unfortunate that these things happen, but it just goes to highlight that the struggle is, is ongoing and people have to be conditioned that there's one human race, as Sister Lisa had said earlier in the program, equals, no difference. How to get that across, it's a challenge, but we do it, it starts from here. It starts with each one of us. Uh, Olivia, I want to you to speak on what's been going on and what actions you've been taking part of. I know that you went to Maui and you have a video for us there. I know you, you're sharing two things. Please uh, address the delegation and, and let us know how we can do to make things better. Good afternoon, sisters. My name is Olivia Guevara. I am a staff member at UNAC UHCP, uh, United Nurses Associations of California, Union of Healthcare Professionals. Uh, we are a healthcare extension of AFSME, so AFSME is our mother union. Uh, and the videos I wanted to share with you all today uh, came out of this idea of our members being able to share their stories. I think once the pandemic hit, um, we saw what the news outlets were sharing with us. Uh, however, what we wanted to do was create space for our members to share their own stories publicly because we didn't want them thinking that they were in silos or that what they were feeling was just um, true to them. We wanted them to know that they weren't alone and what they were feeling, what they were going through in the hospital as they were treating COVID patients or even down to the sacrifices they were making, which isn't very much publicized. For example, we had a lot of members who slept in cars for weeks at a time because they didn't want to go home to infect their families. We also had members who refused to kiss their children for weeks at a time until they got back a negative COVID test. So those sacrifices needed to be publicized and our members needed to hear it. And in turn, we wanted to be able to share that with the public. So this first video I wanna show you is of one of our nurses at St. Francis Medical Center, uh, which is a hospital in Linwood, California. Her name is Maria Nunez. She is an ICU nurse. So I, you, some of you may have seen it um, in the Southern California uh, commercials, uh, but I do wanna share it with you all because it was very touching and very moving and gave us a different look at what it is that our healthcare workers were experiencing. So let me share that, I'm gonna share my screen. I've been an intensive care unit nurse for more than 20 years and I've not seen anything like this virus. This virus is real. This virus is deadly. Every day I go to work, I worry about my patients and I worry about bringing the virus home to my family. The faces change every day, but the story stays the same. I've never expected I have to say goodbye to patients on behalf of their families. The little things, the things you'd say to comfort your child or your wife, they don't get to say those things, I have to. It's just been a sea of patients in the ICU these past nine months. I remember I had to tell one of my patients his son was sorry. The patient's son brought the virus home and infected his father and mother after a night out with friends. Sorry, mommy. That was one of the toughest days. Every day I see regret. I see fear. I see love and sadness in my patients. This virus is real. It's big, it's scary, it's invisible, and it's here among us. But it's not that hard to prevent. 
you can prevent most infections just by wearing a mask and staying at home. You can prevent people from dying. So that was um, a commercial that we aired that we shared with our members first and we had so much positive feedback from our members thanking us for putting their stories out there because that was a majority of what our members were feeling. The second video that I want to share with you sisters is a uh, event that I worked on. Uh, UNAC UHCP represents healthcare workers not only in California but in Hawaii as well. Um, so uh, I actually just flew back in from Maui two days ago, uh, where we put an event for the members in Maui to honor the 35 lives that were lost in Maui County. Um, and this came out of the first video that you saw of, okay, yes, we are going through issues. Uh, we are so concerned. We are so scared. But now, Olivia, what do we do about it? And so the idea of a vigil to commemorate and honor was an idea that they absolutely loved. So the members led this campaign. Um, as you know, Hawaii, you know, they use a lot of their uh, the Hawaiian culture in this. So it was just a beautiful event. Just got this video a couple of days ago. So I wanted the opportunity and privilege to share that all with you all. So here is the second video, one second. Share my screen. Family. And that is the reason why we're here. Tonight we memorialize risking our lives in order to treat COVID positive patients. Rest in peace to more than 3,000 healthcare professionals who have died in the U.S. because of COVID. teared up every time but again this came out of a product of our members wanting to do something now and this was their way of coming together with their local priests and their community and their families uh, to honor their work honor those lives and continue to do the work that we need to do to see through this so thank you thank you sister olivia and i and I appreciate the struggle of the Maui uh, and also those uh, healthcare workers. I'm a first responder myself and I've lost uh, many friends. 
and family, but uh, we must carry on and we must uh, survive so that uh, others can, can uh, be lifted, supported, and follow in our footsteps and lead us into the, the future. I'd like to uh, ask Elise Bryant, uh, sister, loving, caring, spiritual advisor that she is to our community of sisterhood to please acknowledge those uh, that have been passed, uh, those that ever struggled. You gave such an inspirational moment of silence yesterday. Uh, I'd like to ask if you could replicate that here today for those that are here on day two, Sister Elise. Thank you. Yeah, no. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you for sharing uh, your films with us. It's just, yeah. All righty. Giving thanks in the name of all those on whose shoulders we stand, to all the ancestors of this land, the ones who dreamed of this day, who stepped off the boats, who are already here, and, and willed us to be here. Giving thanks for this opportunity to share, breathe, sing, speak together. In the name of all things sacred and all things holy. Ashe, amen. Thank you. Thank you, sisters. I appreciate you for staying here for session one. We have an hour break right now. We'll be back at 1.30. Please enjoy your lunch. I'm sorry that we don't have anything to offer. I would have gotten Grubhub for you have I could, but that will save that for next year, right? Or part two later in the year. Uh, looking forward to the next workshop. We have dynamic speakers. Dynamos, I call them. Ruth Ibarra from uh, Sacramento is going to be hosting uh, the workshop called uh, Women in Leadership and Organizing for Success. That's part two of our program. And I'd like to go to a video that if you came in a little late uh, while uh, Nikki is still having her internet while she travels across country uh, to share that with us. And they'll take us, the break will back at 1.30. Same Zoom. If you have any issues, please contact me. Look forward to seeing you in a, in a little bit. Just give her a moment to load it up. She worked really hard on these videos. I really uh, love her passion and uh,
fabulous job, Nicole. Fabulous. Woohoo! You know, I did want to tell you guys that I had a problem finding some royalty free music, so my son actually created and recorded that for oh, them. Oh, gosh, thank you. You're Excellent. So I was wondering about that, Nicole. Plus, you so bad, you on the road and you doing this. I'm <laughs> scared of you, girl. Snap, 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 snap. <laughs> thank you so much for that and for being here, Elise. You've been just so great to listen to. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely that. Definitely that. All the sisters, Elise, Judy. Hetty, thank you, Hetty, all the way from Cleveland. <laughs> uh, and thank you, uh, Sisterhood in California, nationwide, the sisters, uh, sister presidents, sister national executive board officers, sister international liaisons. Uh, we're going to uh, give a shout out to you. Thank you, Janet, for joining in. Thank you, Susan. I'm glad you had, uh, uh, had was able to get in here, sweetheart. Thank you. And uh, I see Johanna Hester. Should, please come back for part two, sisters, at, at 1.30. Uh, we have a wonderful workshop for you. Olivia is going to be there. Johanna is going to be there. Uh, and uh, Magali is going to be there too. Okay, it is break time, right? Let's go. Let's go to break. So back at 1.30, okay, sister, same Zoom. If you have any issues, please call me or, or email me or text me. And thank you, Becky. Fabulous job too. Thanks for pinch hitting. And hope uh, Tamika as well, and she'll join us soon. And look forward to seeing you, Ruth, uh, and uh, your workshop. All right, I'll see you. Thank you, sisters.